Have you ever sat in a train and while staring at the window, you notice another train on the other platform? And then you start to see that other train moving away. And you start wondering, I wonder where that train is heading to. But a few moments later, you discover that train isn't heading anywhere. It's not that other train that's moving, it's you that's moving. And so although the other train appeared to move, you were the one that actually moving away from the platform. Seems weird, right? That is a concept called relative motion. This video is going to discuss the physics and the mathematics of relative motion. So stay tuned. Now relative motion simply says this. Anytime you see something move, it's simply due to the fact you are observing it moving, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the object is moving relative to something else. So for an example, that train that I just described, that train was moving relative to you, but to a passenger standing on the platform, that train wasn't moving at all. You yourself weren't moving relative to the train you were on, but due to the passenger standing on the platform, you definitely were moving. In other words, all motion is dependent on who observes it. To help explain that a little bit more, and to see what happens when you have two things happening at the same time, let me give you this scenario. So here I have a train and we are standing on the side of the platform watching the train move from left to right. And while watching the train move from left to right, we also have a passenger sitting on top of the train. We have Ted. And so Ted is also moving from left to right. But let's have a close perspective on the train. So now we're sitting on the train and we notice that the train isn't moving relative to us. But Ted, who's sitting on top of the train, decides to move on top of the train to the next carriage, a bit like the old Western movies where the cowboys are running on top of the train carriages. And so now Ted is moving relative to us on the train. So how fast is Ted actually moving? Is he moving with the train or is he actually moving faster than the train? Relative to a person standing on the platform. What if Ted decides to move in the opposite direction? In this case, Ted is moving backwards from right to left, but that is from our perspective on the train. If a person was standing on the platform watching this, he would notice that Ted is still moving in the direction from left to right. And why is that? Well, because the train itself is moving from left to right. Because Ted is moving from right to left, but at a much slower rate than the train is moving from left to right, he is still moving from left to right. How does that look? Well, here is the train. Of course, Ted is moving in that direction relative to the train. And so as a result, we would see Ted still moving forward in that direction. Now, actually, I have a personal example of that. Many years ago, I was standing on the back of a truck and all I did was gently, carefully jump off the back of the truck while it was moving at only about three or four kilometers per hour. However, because of the fact I was actually moving in the forward direction, my attempt to jump in the opposite direction only caused me to fall backwards on my backside because I had forgotten the fact that I, although felt I was moving in the backward direction, I actually, relative to the road, was moving in the forward direction, as these vectors show here. Now, to help us understand the mathematics of it, let's have a closer uh, look at it and introduce you a new term. And this term is called a frame of reference. And a frame of reference is simply the way you observe the world. It is basically a Cartesian plane, a three-dimensional Cartesian plane, where you are the origin. So anything that you see around you, anything that moves around you, is moving relative to your frame of reference. Now, if we go back to our train here, our train, if you were standing on the platform, is moving from left to right. And so we have now a vector that represents that movement in your frame of reference. But if we look at the really closely and we step inside the train, our frame of reference is traveling with us. And so our train is not moving inside our frame of reference, but because Ted is jumping from left to right, we would have a vector here that would represent what Ted is doing in our frame of reference. 
If we now try to do that mathematically to work out what Ted is doing relative to a passenger on the side of the platform, then we have this. So here is the train vector from the platform's perspective. We now have the frame of reference of Ted relative to the train. And what we do is we add them up. So therefore, the velocity or motion of Ted relative to the stationary observer is going to be a vector that is simply the addition of those two vectors. And so what we're saying is this, the velocity of the train relative to the stationary observer to be absolutely accurate, but we'll just say velocity of the train, plus the velocity of Ted relative to the train is equal to the velocity of Ted relative to the stationary observer. Now, if I were to change the direction of Ted and add his motion in the opposite direction, remember this was Ted jumping from right to left, then what is going to happen is this vector is added onto that vector. And what we have, of course, is the total, that is the velocity of Ted relative to a stationary observer, is the resultant of those two vectors. So this is still true. So here we have the velocity of train plus the velocity of Ted relative to the train equals the velocity of Ted. Now, if we use general terminology for that, we get a formula that looks like this. The velocity of B, whatever B is, plus the velocity of A relative to B is equal to the velocity of A. Remember, B and A is from a fixed observer on the Earth, though strictly speaking, they are also relative to the Earth. If we rearrange that equation, we get this, that the velocity of A relative to B is simply equal to the subtraction of velocity A minus the velocity B. Now, the examples I just gave you were just simply in one dimension, but this applies in two dimensions and three dimensions. And for the sake of simplicity, we're going to look at the two-dimensional example. So now let's have a look at this in a two-dimensional perspective. So I have a green car going from south to north. Here I have a red car going from west to east. And of course, they have their own individual velocities. But what would the green car look like it was doing relative to the red car? Well, we can use what we just did before to work that out. So let's have values. So here I have the red car moving at 10 meters per second from west to east and my green car moving from south to north at 15 meters per second. Well, in order to work this out, we need to put these on our vector diagram. And so here is the green car relative to the road and here is the red car relative to the road. And the formula that we need to work out what the green car is doing relative to the red car is this equation here. And so what we have is we say, well, the, the velocity of A relative to B equals velocity of A minus velocity of B. So we want the velocity of the green car relative to the red car. So well, that's equal to the velocity of the green car minus the velocity of the red car. And so what we do is we have our green over here. And then what we do is we subtract this one. Now to subtract a vector here, we have to turn it around. But what we do is we add it up. So we add them head to tail. And it can be seen that the sum total of that is that vector over here. Now what that means is that this vector represents the velocity of the green car as it appears to the red car. Now, when you work that out, it is this a simple mathematical problem, and we can use Pythagoras to work this out. So we know that the velocity is going to be equal to the square root of 10 squared plus 15 squared. And of course, that is going to equal 18.03 meters per second. That isn't the final answer. We also need to know this direction. And so when you work out the angle, you can see that the 10 minus 1 of 
10 over 15 equals 33.6 degrees. And so our car, our green car, relative to the red car, is traveling at 18 meters per second in a direction of north 33.6 degrees west. And here's one example of where we were able to determine the relative velocity. Here's a second problem. So imagine now I have a green car traveling in the north and I have another car going in the northwesterly direction. And this car is traveling fast enough that the car is appearing at an angle of 20 degrees to the westerly direction. So in other words, this car is traveling particularly fast, but we don't know how fast it's going. Can we work it out? Well, first of all, we need to know the velocity of the green car, and that's 15 meters per second. We do know that the red car is moving in that direction, but we don't know how fast, but we do know that the angle here is 45 degrees. So the question is, if this is the vector that represents what the green car sees the red car do, and we know that is 20 degrees, can we work out what the car's speed here actually is? And the answer of that is yes, you can. So first of all, we need to know that the velocity of B plus the velocity of A rel B is equal to the velocity of A. So the velocity, remember what we're interested in is the velocity of A. So the velocity of the B is equal to 15 meters per second. We know that the velocity of the A rel B, the velocity of the red car relative to the green car is in that direction at 20 degrees. And we know that that equals the velocity of the red car, although we do not know the magnitude. But it can be clearly seen that since we already have this as 45 degrees over here, and this here is 20 degrees, we now know that this total angle here, in here, is equal to 110 degrees. So now we have a nice triangle with 110 degrees here, 45 degrees here, and we know this value here is 15. So because of that, we can now see that this value, which we will call x, can be determined by using the sine rule. So what we have is this is 110, so x over the sine of 110 must equal this over here, which we don't know, which we can call p, is equal to p over the sine of 45. And that is equal to this, which is, we know, 15 over the sine. Now, what is the angle over here? We know this is 45. We know this is 110. That's 155. So what's remaining here is 25. We have sine 25. Now x can be determined. x is now equal to 15 multiplied by the sine of 110 divided by the sine of 25. And when that is calculated out, 33.4 meters per second. And there is the car's actual speed. We don't need to worry, of course, about the direction because we know the direction is 45 degrees relative to the road. You could take the next step, of course, and work out this particular value as well, but that's just applying that formula here again. So there you have it. In a summary, we know that all motion is relative. That is, any motion that is measured is measured relative to your frame of reference. However, if there is motion in one frame of reference and also motion in another frame of reference, you can determine the relative motion between those two frames of reference using the formula that I'd shown you earlier. I hope that helps you with relative motion a little bit. I'm Paul from High School Physics Explained. Please like, share and subscribe. Take care. Bye for now.